Hey everyone, the weather is super muggy outside, so all of you are heroes for showing up, investing in yourselves, learning. Um, this is off to a great start already. So, okay, today we're going to talk about storytelling for technical founders and why people are irrational and why you should embrace that instead of fighting it and how we can leverage that to help people care more about you, your work, your product, and your startup. So show of hands real quick, how many of you are founders? OK, a lot of you, most of you. Um, how many of you are technical founders specifically? Cool. And how many of you work at a startup? All right, great. Yes, there was some overlap in the Venn diagram. OK, Did this change? OK, why are we here? I always like starting by setting some context of where you are now where do you want to be, and how do we bridge that gap? So where you are now, there's a lot of interesting opportunities out there for you to exploit. And chances are, if you run a startup, you've spotted one of those opportunities. The problem is that the opportunity that you see and the opportunity that I see is also the opportunity that everyone else sees. So that's a problem. Because that means that competitors have access to the same resources as you do. And that means that competitors can now copy your product faster, easier, and cheaper than ever before. A competitor can hire six engineers in Poland or the Ukraine and potentially catch up with a product that you've been slaving away at for over 18 months. So that feels really scary. Feature differentiation just really isn't enough anymore. What else? Let's say you do have a great product, but when you explain it to customers and to investors, they kind of nod along, but you can tell that they don't really get it. And that can be really frustrating. All right, so where do we want to be? You want to have a more robust toolkit and better levers to talk about your product and talk about yourself. More confidence in being able to know that you can inspire someone to take action and more control over how people perceive you and how they hear your story. So we're going to talk about all of these things today. Who is this for? You're in the right place if you are a technical founder or if you have a non-marketing background. If you want to increase your credibility and your perceived value, both as an individual and for your company, we're going to talk about that. And if you have a sneaking suspicion that facts alone aren't enough to really sway people anymore. So here's my hypothesis. Technical founders who learn how to become great storytellers can drastically increase their chances of being recognized and being funded. So where did this hypothesis come from? Who am I? My name is Wes, and I spent the last 10 years as a hands-on operator and practitioner at a bunch of companies ranging from big ones like L'Oreal and The Gap all the way to small, scrappy organizations like Flight, which was acquired by Snap, and working with Seth Godin to build the Alt-MBA. And one thing that I've seen across all the organizations I've worked at and all the clients I work with now is that everyone basically is trying to do one thing. They're trying to get people to care more about what it is that they're doing. They want people to buy their product, care more about their story, participate in an upcoming launch. It's basically how do we move people to action? And along the way, I've made a ton of mistakes. So I'm hoping that you can avoid some of those knee scrapes by sharing some of the takeaways. So today's goal is to think about things a little bit differently than the way you've been approaching your marketing and your storytelling. We're going to take a non-linear approach. So I'm going to bring up a bunch of examples that are outside of your industry on purpose and try to shake you out of the status quo. So if you leave with one thing that you can try when you're back at your desks, that's a win. All right, so why do technical founders and leaders need to be great at storytelling? First, facts are not enough anymore. 
If facts were enough, then we wouldn't have climate change deniers and anti-vaxxers, and a lot of huge problems that the world is facing would be in a better place than they actually are. So we know that facts aren't enough to get people to actually take action. So what will? Stories. That's what we're going to talk about. Economists really screw us up when they say, uh, assuming all people are rational. Because humans and people were never rational to begin with. And we're going to go over a lot of examples of how humans are rational and what you can do to embrace that. How many of you would consider yourselves a critical thinker? Yes, you care about logic, you care about reasoning, good rationale for things. All of these are awesome. But what if what got you here is actually holding you back now? So you have that rational, critical thinking piece down. You've been doing that, and you know how to do it, and it's gotten you really far. So now we're going to layer in that emotional aspect of how do you connect with people emotionally and tap into all those unsaid things that actually influence why people do what they do. Does it matter if you're actually right? I used to be a lot more hyper-rational and hyper-logical than I am now. And back then, if I had an argument with someone or there was a debate on a certain topic, one of my favorite things to do was to take a screenshot and use a giant sketch arrow, giant pink arrow, and point to whatever it is that I said that I did that they said that I didn't do. So screenshotting and proving that I was right was my way of saying, look, let's settle the argument. I'm right. We're both looking at the same thing now. And nine times out of 10, it completely backfired. And people not only felt annoyed about it, rightfully so, uh, they also dug in their heels even more. So no amount of proving that you're right, sometimes uh, no amount of that is going to change the person's mind. So instead of having that tit-for-tat direct argument, let's circumvent that altogether and win people over in a different way. The second reason storytelling matters is that it helps people see you for who you really are. I'm sure you felt misunderstood or misrepresented by other people before, whether it's the media telling your story or a customer recapping your product, and you're listening and you're like, OK, I mean, you got like 50% of it right, the other 50% not so much. Um, so being able to own your story and tell it yourself gives you more control over that narrative. And then thirdly, startups are about change. And storytelling helps to inspire change. Facts alone, logic alone, reasoning alone, it's kind of dry and it's just there. But stories add meaning. They add context so that people understand the importance and the thought process behind what you do, what you do. OK, so you think your customers care about these things, product features, rational benefits, performance metrics. But what they really care about are these things, how you make them feel, what their boss will think, what's for lunch, and a bunch of other things. So people are busy, and they're constantly thinking about a ton of other stuff. And your product and your startup is a sliver of the stuff that they're thinking about. It's 100% for you, but it might be 1% to 5% for other people. So we want to be open to be willing to bend on what it means to be convincing. If it's not your product features and the things that you're currently doing, what are some other levers that we, <clears throat> that we can tap into? All right. People are irrational. A lot of us think that objects have inherent value, right? That's why they're priced a certain way, and that's why people are willing to pay for, pay for them. So let's do a quick exercise about how objective pricing really is in the eyes of consumers. So raise your hand if you'd rather spend money on one thing or the other. OK, who would rather spend money on a weekend trip? OK, the majority of the room. Who would rather have a new Xbox? OK, the few, the proud. All right, who wants the $500 watch? 
I'm gonna go with that one. Okay, who wants a $500 meal? All right, new West Elm living room. Okay, ski trip to Whistler. Okay, we are in Canada, all right, <laughs> nice. That's the most people that have chosen Whistler. Um, okay, so $5,000 on a Tony Robbins event, professional development of some kind, okay? Or that same amount of money on a trip abroad. Okay, nice. And last one, $350 headphones or $350 shoes? Okay, so headphones, anyone? Okay, shoes? Cool. Um, What's interesting about this exercise every time I do it is that the split between the two is always really, really different. I spoke at uh, an audience of retailers once, and uh, the $350 shoes, they felt like we're on the lower end of shoes, so they said they would rather have the headphones, because that means they're nice headphones, and then save up the money to buy nicer shoes. <laughs> and then other audiences that I talked to will say, um, I literally didn't even realize that $350 shoes existed. Like, that's five times as as much as I thought the most expensive shoes were. Um, and headphones, by the way, get up to the, the thousands, right, for really nice headphones. Okay, perceived value is value. There's no difference between the actual objective value of something and the perceived value. It is whatever it is in your customer's head. And we underpay and overpay for things all the time, depending on who you ask. And there's products and services being sold at all ends of the market. So you have people selling 1994 used Kias, and then there are people selling Bugattis and, and buying Bugattis and Aston Martins and, uh, and Teslas, right? So, and all along the spectrum, there's products being sold. Same with your industry. So before you say something is too expensive or uh, too cheap, think about which audience that you're really trying to tap into. What seems absurd for one person might be totally normal for someone else. So how does this impact your marketing? The most important way is that you really want to talk to people who think the same way as you do when it comes to pricing. Because someone might think that uh, $5 on Frappuccinos every day makes sense, but think that paying 99 cents for your app is absurd, never, that's crazy. They want a free version and they're offended that you're willing to charge 99 cents for it, right? So just because someone is willing to spend money or has disposable income, doesn't mean that they're willing to spend that on you. So you really wanna find people who share your worldview when it comes to pricing around your category. All right, so now we're gonna rapid fire through a bunch of frameworks, concepts, first principles of marketing. So take what's helpful for you, discard the rest. Okay, nothing is objectively good or bad. Just talked about that a little bit. Uh, the thing to really think about here is to stop being judgmental. You know, all of us, we stand by our choices. That's why you make them, right? You think that choosing a ski trip, of course, that makes so much sense and, and is such a better decision than spending money on furniture, whatever, right? But for everything that you think is a good decision, there's someone who disagrees with you and is doing the opposite and thinks that they're being perfectly rational and perfectly smart about how to spend their money. So by not being judgmental and by removing that judgment, you can empathize with your customer more and think about how do I tap into their current worldview and reframe what it is that I'm doing, not in the way that, that I think it should be, but in the way that they want to hear it. If we think about value, you can decrease friction, so this is all new value here, um, or you can increase desire, and that's all new value. So this, this net is the amount of value that you're creating. So what does decreasing friction look like? It means making the button bigger, making the button a brighter blue so it catches people's eyes, putting everything above the fold and adding as many pop-ups as you can to capture people's information. Uh, it also means sending a ton of reminder emails and any kind of promotion is decreasing friction, right? So reverse promotion, this price goes up next week, you should buy it now, um, any kind of sale, any, any bundle. And the idea behind decreasing friction is the premise that if I make this easy enough for you, you're going to want this. 
But we know that that's not really true because there's all kinds of startups and all kinds of businesses giving away free stuff, free content, free trials, freemium trials, right, that um, you still don't want. So it's free. It literally couldn't cost anything else, but you still don't want it. So there's a cap to the amount of value that you can create just by decreasing friction. All right, so what if we layer in increasing desire? What happens when we really want something? This is the line outside of Momofuku Milk Bar when they opened in DC. These are all presumably really busy people who are here on a Tuesday afternoon in line for ice cream. These are the same people who said they were too busy to take your call and too busy to hop on a demo with your business development team, by the way. And so, but here they are, right? So they have time for some things, but just not for others. Here's a guy who just bought an iPhone. He looks like he won the lottery. Uh, so when, when you increase desire, when people want something, they're willing to stand in line for it. They're willing to bend their schedules to fit you. Um, and when they finally say, you know, take my money, and they give you their money, they're super proud and telling all of their friends about how they were able to give you their money. So increasing desire is something really important to think about. Don't just remove friction when you're working on your product or your marketing funnels. Think about how do I make people actually want this more? How can I make this more exciting for people? How many of you have heard of Simple Human, the trash cans? OK, does anyone have a Simple Human? All right, great. I know you have good taste. OK, this is what a trash can looks like. We all know this is a typical trash can. This is a simple human trash can. It looks like an iPhone. It's the iPhone of trash cans. This trash can is $200, and it's this stainless steel beauty that sits in your house. And what's so fascinating about simple human is there's this little tribe of simple human owners where if you go to someone's house, they have a simple human, you're going to say, oh, I have one of those. Aren't they great? So, so people will let you know if they have a simple human. This is what you want to create, this kind of tribal identity of if you have this or if you use this app or if you are a customer of a certain brand, then we have something in common. So simple human has done a really good job of that. And there's a lot to deconstruct here with simple human, um, but the biggest the biggest thing is, what tribe do you <clears throat> get to belong in if you buy a simple human? So when you're thinking about your product, think about what tribe does someone get to be belong in if they are one of your customers? What do people like us do? So building on this idea of community, of identities, there are a lot of unspoken rules when it comes to certain communities. So there, are, there might be unacceptable words, right? So in a certain group, um, using certain terms is considered bad, it's derogatory, uh, and people like us know not to use those words. We're good people. And then on the other hand, there are people who are happily using a ton of words that are considered not acceptable elsewhere, and their communities think it's fine, and their peers think it's fine. So which tribe do you belong in, and the tribe that your customers belong in helps shape what they consider normal and good. There is no objective normal or no objective good. Tipping is a great example of that, of the social pressure from the people around us. So I used to live in San Francisco, and when I moved to New York, all of my New Yorker friends said, you have to tip 20% less. And I thought, 15 to 18, is normal, right? Like, that's good. That's, that's, that's decent. And I thought 20% was absurd. So I moved to New York, and within two weeks, I'm tipping 20% for everything, including to-go coffees, where I'm not even staying for service. So how did that happen? When thinking about tipping, I didn't want to be that person at brunch at the end when everyone when the, when the waitress brings uh, the bill and we're splitting it and everyone's writing 
you know, what they're, what they're tipping and then turning the receipt upside down. The risk of someone flipping that over and realizing that I had tipped a couple percentage points lower than everyone else and therefore signaling that I did not belong was, was too big to overcome. So I just thought, you know what? It's only a couple percentage points. I'm just going to go ahead and do the normal thing here, 20%. It's fine. So there are all kinds of situations like this on a daily basis where we do certain things because we think, oh, it's the most logical thing to do. But really, it's how do I want to be viewed and perceived by the people around me, by people whose opinion I care about. So you really want to position your product in a way where people's friends, your customer's friends, their family, their boss, their peers are going to think that they are a smart person for using your product, not someone to be ostracized and that you know, doesn't belong. So speaking of people like us, I love this photo. I think it's very funny. Um, these are all people you might recognize, Silicon Valley investors, whatnot. And it's very clear that they have a certain uniform going on. The vest, right, usually from Patagonia, the shirt. So what does this look? I mean, I've thought about starting a Tumblr called Friends Who Dress Alike, because when you're walking on the street, you've probably seen groups of friends who all kind of wear the same thing, right? And maybe you do that with your friends too, but, but you just think of it as a normal thing. So there's, there's safety in tribes of signaling that I belong, I am one of you. And that's something that's deeply ingrained in us, and it's something that you want to tap into so that you understand what looks normal when it comes to your customers. What do they think of as normal? What do they think of as aspirational? Because we aspire to be different things, right? So what do your customers think is cool and aspirational? And how can you tap into that instead of trying to change their minds to believe in something else? I love this Easter egg that iPhone users have. How many of you use iPhones? Okay, how many of you judge people who have the green bubble when you text with them? Yeah, so this is a great Easter egg uh, that Apple does to reinforce the tribe mentality and, and the identity piece of if you're an iPhone user, you can tell who is a fellow iPhone user because they have this blue bubble. So what are ways that you can drop these Easter eggs in your product? What does this remind me of? The semiotics and heuristics of your product. Great thing to think about. So if we look at these brands, there's a distinct look to them. How many of you have heard of Hims, the skincare or hair care brand for men? Cool, OK. Um, so Rogaine is also for men uh, to tackle balding. Um, and Hims does also. But Hims is targeting a completely different audience and you can tell that with their design aesthetic and all of their product decisions. So when you're thinking about what does this remind me of, do you want to remind people of Rogaine or of Hims? Do you want to be Bank of America or do you want to be Wealth Simple? There's different psychographics of people who shop or frequent both, right? There's a lot of, of RBC, um, Bank of America customers, but there's also a lot of Wealth Simple, Betterment, et cetera, customers, right? So what do you want to remind people of? And how are your design choices reflecting that? A lot of times when we think about stories, we think about the story that we want to tell. That's the most obvious thing, right? Like, what story do I want to tell? But the story that's the most important and way more important than any story you want to tell is a story that people tell themselves in their own head without ever saying it out loud to you? What's the story that they tell themselves and that they tell the people around them? Their family, their friends, their coworkers. If someone has to admit that they aren't very smart and that's why they need to use your product or they're deficient in some way and that's why they need to use your product, they're not gonna wanna admit that to themselves. That's, that's forcing them to tell themselves a story that's that's pretty painful and hard on anyone's psyche, right? So you really want to craft your story so that you make people smarter for wanting to engage with you, and you reward them for engaging with you.
All right, worldviews and psychographics. Why does it matter? Demographics are stuff that you can see on the outside. So age, gender, where someone lives, what their profession is. And psychographics are things on the inside. So this is the stuff going on inside their heads. And it's a lot more useful to you as you're crafting your stories and crafting your marketing than any demographics are. So this is what values do they have, what are their hobbies, what are their lifestyle choices. So someone might say that I'm an early adopter. Uh, and if they say that, you want to really dive a level or two deeper into the psychographics behind that. Because someone can be an early adopter in one area, but be a late adopter in another. So you might be the first to try new music and the first to check out new movies, but uh, you've been using Irish Springs soap for the past 15 years. It's perfectly fine. You don't plan on changing anytime soon. Or you um, are an early adopter when it comes to um, tech gadgets. So you're always first to try the latest gadget. Um, but you're a late adopter when it comes to um, furnishing your home or home appliances, right? Like in any category, there's people who are earlier and later, and it doesn't necessarily mean they are that way universally across the board. So when someone tells you they're an early adopter, figure out in what way and how are they not an early adopter in other ways? When you think about the customers that you're going after, you have your diehard fans. These are the people that before you launched already like, yes, I love this, I'm so glad you're making this, I've been waiting for this to exist. These are the people that are in the core of your circle. So when you're thinking about growing though, you need to expand beyond those people. So how do you expand and how do you know the right people to target and how your marketing and your stories need to change to reflect that you're now talking to a slightly different group? So I like thinking about this in terms of concentric circles, where in the center you have your diehard fans, and then with each rung outward, you're expanding only to touch the rung immediately outwards. So you might want to reach everyone eventually, uh, but before we get to everyone, there's a lot of someones that you need to get to. So this helps you prioritize what stories should I be telling that tap into this next rung's psychographics and worldviews. Facebook is a great example of this. They started with Harvard, and then they went to Ivy League schools, and then all colleges, and then high schools, and now your grandma and your 14-year-old niece all have Facebook. But if they had started out targeting everyone, they would have had a lot harder of a time growing as fast as they did. So focus on the inner rungs of the circle, because by the time the outer rungs hear about it, the other rungs are going to convince them that this is a good idea, and it's going to be proven and safe. All right, shifting from personas to worldviews. This is another thing to keep in mind as you're telling stories. So, uh, a, lot of, a lot of us have learned about personas. So we create someone like vegan Vanessa, flexitarian Frank, right? This is a, a picture of a person, um, and then you market to that person. I think that personas can be a little bit rigid because you rarely ever meet someone who fits your persona perfectly. Uh, but more importantly, translating your persona into outward-facing messaging is kind of hard. So you have this perfect persona on paper, but what do you do with it? How do you create copy for your website, for your social channels, for your pitch, for your slide decks? So I like using worldviews because it's much easier to translate worldviews into outward-facing messaging, which is the end goal when you're creating a lot of materials. So worldviews are great because they cut through demographics. They cut through what people look like on the outside. So at the Alt-MBA, uh, we had students that were all ages. So our youngest student was 22, and the oldest one was 70. So if we had tried marketing based on demographics, it would have been all over the place. Like, where do you even start with that? But when we look at psychographics, there were really clear trends about the way that people thought. So people considered themselves lifelong learners. They took pride in um, pushing outside of their comfort zones. Um, most of them did professional development and ongoing um, education, whether it's reading or attending workshops, et cetera. 
right? So there are a lot of threads of what it means um, to be someone who's a lifelong learner. And tapping into that makes it a lot easier to write messaging that caters to that person. How many of you have heard of Wirecutter? OK, a few of you. OK, Wirecutter is a review site that got bought out by the New York Times a couple years ago. Um, they do these really in-depth reviews of pretty much every household product. So the demographics, pretty straightforward, 25 to 35 year olds, uh, men and women, but mainly men, um, major cities, disposable income, familiar with tech. There's a lot of brands and companies, though, that could target a demographic like this. So this is still very, very broad. All right, so what if we go a level deeper and talk about psychographics? Psychographics, now things start getting interesting. How many of you have heard about maximizers versus satisficers? OK. So maximizers are people who do a ton of research on something and overanalyze a decision before coming to their choice. And once they decide, they're still a little bit unhappy because there could have been something that they missed when analyzing their decision. Satisficers are the opposite. They'll go with whatever is good enough. And once they hit something that's good enough, they'll make that decision. So there's research that shows that maximizers and satisficers end up making about the same um, level of good decisions. Um, but one just ends up being a little bit unhappy about it, and then other people are happier about it. So, so Wirecutter targets the psychographic of maximizers 100%. They target people who are logical, who are hyper-rational, who love doing research, who are a little bit skeptical, uh, and a little bit contrarian. So how does this play out and influence their product and all the messaging that comes from that? Maximizers. These are the kinds of things that people tell themselves. This is the story that's going on in their head. I want the best. Hyperlogical. There's objectively a better answer, and I'm going to find it. Resourceful, analytical, cerebral, I want to know that I did my research. So when you think about psychographics and you map them out for your customer, map out the actual language of what that person is saying to themselves. What is the story they're saying to themselves? I do this, or I believe this, or I think this is better. Fill in those blanks to get a really clear idea of how people um, approach your product and your category. OK, so knowing that Wirecutter thinkers or their customers think like this, they're skeptical, they take pride in being smart, they're a little contrarian. These are screenshots of, of their site, so their product. So where do you see some of that playing out? If we know that they're targeting maximizers, how is this playing out in their messaging? Just go ahead and shout it out. OK, maybe shouting it out wasn't a great idea. OK, raise your hand, and I'll point at you. Yep. Very organized, OK, yep. What else? They all, say the best. they all say the best. Yeah, in every single product category, they say best. What else? Yeah, absolutely. They've tested 79 water bottles, <laughs> not like 20. You know, also, they've broken it down into categories. So in case you think that they forgot the metal ones and only looked at the plastic ones, you can feel safe that they've actually looked at the full spectrum. So Wirecutter taps into their customer site graphic. And basically, for people who are maximizers, seeing this is just like lighting up, your brain lighting up in all kinds of different ways, because this is exciting. This is exciting that this site has done so much detailed research on products that you would have had to research yourself for weeks. So the Surface product is we do product reviews. But the deeper level, the underlying level, is that I, as a maximizer consumer, can feel good that I can trust Wirecutter for their product recommendation without having to do all of that research myself and all the agony that comes with the overanalysis. I can skip all of that and still feel like I'm making a really smart choice.
All right, so worldviews and psychographics, this is super important stuff, and it's really all around us. Um, and, it's, and it's reflected in the choices that you make. So let's do a quick exercise. Let's split the room into three groups. So you all on the left can be um, a co-op, a local organic mart, OK? Um, everyone in the middle shops at Whole Foods. And everyone on the right shops at Sobeys. So take 10 seconds to think about why your choice is better than everyone else's. So here's where you do want to get a little bit judgmental. You're being intentionally judgmental to get into the heads of people that you want to get into the heads of. So how does each group rationalize their decision to go with one versus the other? So let's start with the local co-op, the mom and pop shop uh, with a homemade sign and this friendly looking guy. What are the reasons that shopping at the co-op makes the most sense? What was that? It's true, it's true to your values. Yes, great. What else? You're helping the local economy. Awesome. Same point? OK, what else? Right, better for the environment, it's more local. Yep, absolutely. OK, group in the middle, Whole Foods. You classy, classy people. OK, so why is Whole Foods obviously the best choice? Yes, highly curated selection. Yep, you have your organic chia seeds next to your Greek yogurt, also organic, locally sourced. Bigger wine alley, OK. So they, they cater to um, categories that you're interested in. Awesome. What else? It's a one-stop shop, OK. How about the experience? There's no, there's no neon, or not neon, there's no fluorescent lights at Whole Foods. None of that plebe stuff, right? It's like warm lighting, beautiful fruit in neat, organized rows. The minute you take an apple, someone else replaces that apple. So it's a beautiful, beautiful experience, right? Did you want to add something? Yep. It's ex exactly expensive, so it must be better. Great worldview, right? A lot of people definitely have that worldview. So in that case, making your product cheaper actually makes it less likely for someone with that worldview to want to buy it because they're going to equate cheap with not so great. Okay, Sobeys, practical, practical people. All right, Sobeys. Why Sobeys? Cheap and convenient. Yeah, absolutely. Great value, right? Being smart with your money. That's right. Oh, those Whole Foods people, so pretentious. Yeah, so these people are down to earth. They go in, they get what they need, right? OK, other reasons. Good selection. Good selection, yeah. So you have everything from Chips Ahoy to fruits and vegetables, everything in between. You can get pretty much everything that you need. Awesome. So when you're thinking about your own category and your industry, Mapping out the different players and people's worldviews when they uh, purchase from your competitor or frequent another peer of yours, these are great things for you to map out because those people think that they're making a perfectly smart choice, and, but they're not choosing you. So to get into their heads of why they might not be choosing you and how to win some of them over, you really want to understand why do people consider themselves perfectly rational and logical for shopping at all ends of that spectrum. Social proof, de-risking fear. OK, why is it important to de-risk stuff? It's important because people really hate change. Even when we want to change, when something is literally good for us, not for anyone else, but purely uh, self-serving, right? So sleeping earlier, drinking more water, reading a little bit every day, Right? These are all things that are not a lot of our to-do lists. But even when we really want to do something and we know it's absolutely good for us, it's still really hard to do. It's really hard to get ourselves to change our behavior. So especially if you're doing something new that hasn't been done before, whatever it is that you're proposing and offering is going to sound really risky. So 
Inertia, the status quo, these are your biggest competitors. It's getting people to be willing to take that first step with you. So if you can de-risk what it is that you're offering, that makes it a lot more likely that people will be willing to take that first step. This all really begs the question, though, of whether your marketing might be a little bit selfish. We all want people to download our apps or sign up for an account or become a customer. So everyone's really going after the same stuff. But if we put ourselves in the shoes of our customers, they might be thinking, you know, yeah, you want me to, to download this app, but I don't even know you. My life is fine before I met you, so why do I need to do this? Maybe someday in the future, right? That's, that might be the best that you get is someday in the future, but certainly not now. So we really need to shift the dynamics here and stop focusing so much on ourselves and what we want people to do. Because yes, you have goals, everyone has goals, and everyone's trying to meet them, but what are you doing differently that's getting people to want to do the thing that you want them to do? So focusing on you is super important. Focusing on you, the customer. Even when you're writing about your product or for your, about yourself, you should really be writing about the customer. So not necessarily just physically typing the word you and hoping for the best, um, but restructuring everything so that you're appealing to that person. And here's a good example of that. So on the left, we have really typical copy, the About Us page. Our product makes reporting simple for our customers. We are proud of our industry-leading customer service team and low downtime. OK, so it's not horribly offensive or anything. It's decent. But look how much better it is when you shift a couple words around and focus on the customer. Now it becomes, we simplify reporting for you and your team. You'll never have to worry about downtime. Our industry-leading support team is ready to serve you. So as a customer reading that, you immediately feel more taken care of. You feel like the company is putting your needs first and that they're not being selfish. So there are a ton of changes that you can make um, that are pretty low-hanging fruit that you could start doing today that shift the focus back on the customer and change that entire emotional experience. All right, shifting gears a little bit. What will I tell my boss? This is a classic case of covering your ass. Anyone who's ever worked at a company where they've had a boss knows that it's important that your boss knows that you're doing great work and you're making smart decisions on behalf of the company. And why is this important? A lot of you are founders, a lot of you work at startups, where presumably there's not as much of that hierarchy. But if you're selling to an organization, if you're doing B2B selling of any kind, you're probably interacting with people who have bosses, who have bosses, who have bosses. So it's really important that you think about how can bringing our product into your company make you look like a hero? Because if you're asking someone to put their career on the line and risk their reputation or risk getting into trouble because they decided to sign the company up for an up-and-coming startup's product, no one else is using it yet, that feels really, really scary. And that's pretty unfair to your internal buyer. So the more that you can de-risk that experience and make it seem like this is a no-brainer, this is not going to blow up, this is going to be great, the more that you can convince them of that, the safer you're going to make that feel. So you really want to speak to that big voice, the outer rational voice, and that little voice, that internal, nagging, emotional, uh, illogical, irrational voice inside that says, well, how does this benefit me? When, when customers think about your product, they're really thinking about that. So you want to give them both the rational reasons, but also that emotional reason. I love this tweet. It's by a VC, I think, in San Francisco. Uh, he says, the number of required courses at Harvard or Stanford focused on sales, zero. And the number of sales that came from doing sales, 100. Everything is a sales conversation. A lot of times, you might say something because you think it's 
convincing for the other person. But if you're really honest with yourself, it's because you wanted to express yourself in some way. Maybe the person was a little bit frustrating. Uh, maybe you wanted to set the record straight about something, right? We have all kinds of reasons for wanting to communicate stuff. But a great litmus test and criteria when you're figuring out what story should I tell, what should I say, period, to everyone around me, including your internal team and customers, is, is this strategy or self-expression? If it's self-expression, save it for a friend or for a colleague to talk about on the side. But when you're having that important conversation with someone and you want to change their behavior, you want to motivate their behavior, only do stuff and say stuff that strategically advances that conversation. Surprisingly, if you use this filter, you can trim down emails by 70, 80%, because you realize, you know what, I just wanted to tell you this thing. It actually doesn't get you closer to saying yes to me or for doing the thing that I want you to do. So this is a great criteria to keep in mind. So we talked a little bit about the fear of making a mistake, of buyer's remorse. Any time that someone is about to make a decision of any kind, where there are stakes on the line and they have skin in the game, um, all these memories of all the times that you've been burned in the past kind of bubble up a little bit. And you're reminded of that one time where you bought this thing and it sucked and you couldn't get a refund and you felt stupid. So this is the context that you're working with when you, uh, when you ask for a sale. Social proof can help to de-risk that. It can help to lower the anxiety that comes with thinking about buyer's remorse. So what does social proof look like? Here are a bunch of examples. If you have investors, people look at, inve at your investors and think, wow, there were some smart people who think that this startup is worth investing in. They must be doing something right. Or press, a famous magazine wrote about the startup. They must be legit. Or word of mouth, a friend that I trust told me about this. I trust my friend, therefore I trust you. There are a ton of examples of social proof, and you see them all around you every day. So when you walk by a restaurant, it looks kind of good, but there's no one inside. That sets off a little bit of a red flag. When a restaurant is bustling and full of people, there's a line out the door, there's a waiting list. A lot of times that's a clue that this could be something that a lot of people have said is good and is probably a safer bet. Same with bestseller status. Bestselling books tend to sell way more than the average book because once something becomes a bestseller and people need a quick read or they want to buy someone a gift, am I going to choose the obscure book no one has ever heard of to give to my mother-in-law? Or am I going to choose the best-selling book that's on the shelves in Indigo and a bestseller on Amazon? Probably the latter. So these are all examples of social proof in our daily lives. Testimonials, an advisory board, board of directors, these are all social proof. This is a screenshot from Casper, and they've executed on social proof really beautifully. I mean, who are we to disagree with Architectural Digest, right? And, and all these stars uh, for Google reviews. And the copy here is entirely about de-risking. So steps one, two, and three, like any concern that you could possibly have about trying Casper, you know, oh, is it complicated if I don't like it? Do I have to bring it to a store or roll it up or something? It's going to be super annoying. Um, they've basically handled all of that. They say that you can sleep on it for 100 nights free, and then we'll pick it up if you hate it. So just drop it on your doorstep and, and leave it, and we'll pick it up. So they've made it super easy to feel like, all right, why don't I give this a try? And once you have it in your home, you're probably going to keep it. OK, we're going to do a, a quick exercise now. So psychographics, worldviews, learned a lot about that. Now I want you to think about why your customers might be right for picking your competitor. And don't do it in a way where you know, an interviewer asks you, what's your biggest weakness? And you say, I'm really responsible. I care too much. I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. Those are throwaway answers, and we all know that. So, You'll get more from this exercise if you actually answer it. So think about 
what kind of person is picking your competitor, and why are they right to do so? So think about it for 10 seconds, and then we're going to call on some people uh, if you raise your hand. Um, you don't have to say the name of your competitor. Just say what it is that, uh, that customers might be thinking of when they decide to buy from your competitor instead of from you. All right. Who wants to go? Yes. A recognizable brand. OK. All right, so they have credibility. They're recognizable. Awesome. What else? They're, OK, so their product is more built up and a lot easier to get. So it's much more convenient to use them as opposed to digging to try to find you guys. OK, awesome. What else? Can you repeat that? Less hurdles in the onboarding process. Awesome. Right, so if someone signs up, it's a lot easier to get up to speed. They've thought about the user experience. Awesome. So this is great for you to do with your own team when you have a little bit more time. Um, and the key takeaway here is really that you want to respect your, cu your customers and your competitors. Respect their intelligence and assume that they've thought about their situation and they've looked at your competitor and felt like it was a better fit for them. So think about what makes them a better fit and how can you swoop in and be a better fit than your competitors are. All right, so by now you've started to see that everything that you do is a story. Your pricing is a story. You, yourself, the way that you come across is a story. Your design, your aesthetic, all of your product choices, these are all stories. So what's the biggest challenge for technical founders, though, when it comes to telling stories? Well, technically, well, technically is the death of all stories. When you are about to say, well, technically, or your co-founder is about to say it to you, just stop. Just stop right there, because whatever great story was about to happen is now no longer going to happen. And why is that? Well, you have the curse of knowledge as someone who knows your product really, really well. You know the entire story. You know the entire history, right? And real life is really messy. It looks like a jumbled pile of string or a necklace that is really hard to untangle once it starts to look like that. And, and a story, though, on the other hand, is a straight arc. It's a straight line. It's A to B, right, with some stuff in the middle, but it's really clean. It's really neat. It gets wrapped up in a nice bow. So if you're thinking, OK, for my story, I really have to tell this entire thing starting from the very beginning and include every single detail, you're really going to lose people. Stories are always a simplification of the truth. So when you are simplifying, you're prioritizing some information over others. So the more that you embrace that there is some prioritization going on, that you are showing a select version of what happened, the better. And of course, you should always stick with the truth. That's a no-brainer, right? So don't lie about anything. But you also don't have to tell everything right up front in um, an hour-long narrative arc, hero's journey style story. And when you think about, all right, so I'm on board the jumbled mess. I'm on board with turning it into a point A to point B clean type of story. So what do I talk about, though? How do I narrow down all the things that I could talk about and pick the right ones? So this is less about what you want to say and more about what would be helpful for your audience to hear. A lot of times, just using that as your litmus test already trims down half of all the stuff that you were going to say in the first place. So the more that you shift into being of service to your audience, the more useful it is going to be for them, the more their eyes are going to light up when you tell the story, and the more you have a chance to continue that conversation and build that relationship. You want to be careful when you have a lot of cool features that you don't scare people away because you dive into talking about all of those cool features. 
You should definitely be proud of what you're building, of course. Uh, but a lot of times, saying too much too fast tends to scare people away. So before launching into your coolest features, think about what's one or two things that I can talk about that will hook people in gradually and then start that conversation and earn the permission for me to show up again to tell you a little bit more. Start right before you get eaten by the bear. This is a great tip. How many times have you listened to a story from a friend and they gave you a ton of backstory talking about this thing? So they're telling you about their camping trip and they start talking about three months ago, the logistics of planning around everyone's schedules, of buying all the right supplies at Mech, of booking, getting your camping permits, the drive up there, needing to rent the car and what a hassle that was. Anyway, by the time they get to the story, the, the exciting part, you realize, 30 minutes later that someone left beef jerky outside the tent and a bear came and everyone almost died, right? So a lot of times we bury that lead. We bury the exciting part of the story because there's all this other backstory that we're telling people. And you'd be shocked that if you cut out most of that backstory, people would probably still get your main point. So whenever you're about to tell a story, think about how can I trim the backstory as much as possible do that, practice that story, and then trim the backstory some more. Because I guarantee you that there are more places where you can trim so that your audience can focus on the part that you actually want them to focus on. The jab, jab, cross method. This is about layering your stories. You know, if you think that you have one chance to tell a story, you have one shot, throw back to Eminem a little bit, um, you might think that you know, you have this one chance to say this long story, and if you don't get everything across, then you're screwed, but that's really not true. What you want to do is say enough to get the permission to be invited back to tell a little bit more. People's attention spans aren't that long, so if you can tell them a little bit and do a little bit of jab, jab, cross versus one giant right hook to try knocking them out, this is a much better way for, to take the pressure off of yourself of needing to say too much all at once. And it's a better experience for your customer. We talked a lot about a lot of different techniques, frameworks, concepts. So you might be thinking, how do I keep this all in my head while still staying present to tell a story? That, be, that can be really, really hard. So if there's one takeaway from today, I want you to embrace testing your stories. What that means is when you're telling someone a story, there's usually that moment in the conversation where their eyes light up because you've said something that has captured their interest. And you can tell that. It's not, it's not anything quantifiable, but it's just a shift in energy. And you can tell when you're talking to someone. So when you're telling your story, don't get too caught up in trying to remember, am I doing this? Did I remember to do that? Oh, but I forgot to do this. When you, when you do that, you're not in the moment with the person that you're talking to. So stay in the moment and watch for their reaction. Watch for what their face is saying to you. Watch what their energy level is saying. If, if, if the person is looking bored or they're kind of looking behind them, switch it up a little bit. Test a different angle, right? So you don't have to stick with whatever your original plan was. Do whatever it takes to make the person's eyes light up. Be specific. Being specific is a very useful, low-hanging fruit way to swap out some of your copy or swap out some of the language from your stories. Um, if I were to say Japan versus Fukuoka, there's, a, there's just a different level of credibility when you name something that's a little bit more specific. Um, another great example is vanilla. If I say vanilla ice cream, it sounds like the most boring thing, but if I say Tahitian vanilla or Madagascar vanilla, all of a sudden it's like, okay, now we're talking. Like This is something that a nice, bistro, chic restaurant might offer, right? So the more specific you are, the more credible you seem. So anytime that you're talking generalities, how can you swap out one of the nouns for something that's a little bit more specific? A great story is one where the listener pretty much comes to a conclusion themselves. You don't have to say, here is the lesson, because when you tell the story, People feel the lesson. 
some of the best fiction stories move us so much because we feel what the main character felt. So the idea of do you get it or do you get it, my friend Shaolu talks about that, and it's basically the idea that you might intellectually get something. Yeah, I understand it. I acknowledge it exists. But there's a difference between that and really getting it, viscerally, emotionally, knowing that it is true. So when you tell stories, you really want to aim for that ladder because that hooks in that emotional aspect and makes whatever you're saying so much more memorable. This is one of my favorite stories about Kobe Bryant. Basically, he calls one of his teammates at what time, three in the morning or something, 3.30, um, and he asks his teammate if he wants to practice at the gym together. And, and this story is told from the perspective of the teammate who gets this call. He's still sleeping, picks up this call, realizes it's Kobe, um, and he meets Kobe at the gym. He thinks it's super early. This is earlier than he ever gets to the gym, but Kobe is, is already drenched in sweat, and he's been practicing for God knows how long already. So with a story like this, there's nowhere in the story that says, Kobe has a great work ethic. Kobe works really hard and tries a lot harder than everyone else, right? There's, it's not as explicit, but you get that visceral, emotional understanding that, holy crap, Kobe is a next level athlete because he does what most people are not willing to do. So this is a great example of a story that helps illustrate that show, not tell, because Nowhere does it digest, okay, here's, here's what Kobe is like, but you absolutely feel that. Other examples, I have a friend who's really type A, and she works with, uh, she coaches um, type A people, and um, she tells them that she does her finances to relax, because she actually is very type A herself, and anyone who does her finances to relax, like, okay, I trust you, you are super, super anal attentive and very, very analytical. My friend Darvinder wanted to be a UX designer. Um, he would wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to self-learn UX until he finally got a job in UX. Um, so he could go around telling employers, um, I'm really resourceful and I try really hard and I'm a fast learner. That's pretty elementary. He could say that. Or he could do the show not tell method and say, for six months, I woke up every day at 5 a.m. before I got to work at 8 and taught myself UX design by watching videos, reading blogs, and doing freelance work for different clients. Another friend of mine was talking about his scrappiness. I just met him at an event, and, um, and he told a story about how his car ran out of gas once when he was trying to get to an event. So he hailed uh, a pizza car, he ordered a pizza, told the pizza car to meet him at a certain place and drop off the pizza at another place. And that's how he got to his destination because he had run out of cash. Um, so he could have said, I'm really scrappy, I'm really resourceful, I find a way to make things happen. But this story, which is, I don't know, less than 20 words, showed that he really is in fact pretty good at figuring things out. Okay, so we're gonna practice tailoring our stories and uh, thinking about our audiences and the level of understanding that your customer might have. So, different levels. Okay, here's this, this is a YouTube video where this guy explains what harmony means to a child, so that's level one, to a teenager, to a college student, to a professional, and to Herbie Hancock a Grammy award-winning artist, musician, and jazz legend. So, turn to someone who's near you, who you don't know, and ask which level they would say they are when it comes to your industry. So don't assume, just ask them, I, you know, my startup is in electric vehicles, how much do you know about this? And they might say, ooh, I don't know anything. I'm a level one, or they might say, I'm level five. I actually run an electric vehicle startup myself. 
And in that case, tailor your story to fit that person. So find someone who's sitting near you um, and explain what your product does. Your product, uh, your idea, what challenge um, your customers face and what you're solving for them. Tell them a little bit about yourself and your product, but tailor it to the level of understanding that they have. Uh, so we're going to do that for a couple minutes, and then I'll call time, and then you can switch, and they can then uh, tell you about their startups. OK, go. OK, stop. All right, so wrap up your conversations and find someone else that you don't know that you're sitting next to. So basically, switch partners and find someone else and try the activity again. Ask them what level they are and tell your story. OK, did anyone have people who had really different levels of understanding about your industry? Or had a different level at all? So did you talk to someone who was level two and then someone else who was a four? Yep. A level two and a level five? OK, great. Anyone else? Awesome. Um, any learnings that came from that? Was there anything surprising? when you were telling your story and needing to adjust it to tailor it to that person. Yep. I thought I was level one, and he said I would have been much higher than that. Oh, OK. Awesome. All right. Anything else? All right, it's late in the afternoon. Give you a pass. I'll give you a pass this time. OK. All right, last section, turning bugs into features. What does this mean? In the 60s, Avis, a rental car company, was number two. And Hertz was their main competitor, and they were number one. And back then, everyone wanted to be number one. I mean, it's still great to say that you're number one today. Um, but back then, no one ever proudly said, hey, I'm number two. Um, but Avis really flipped the script and started doing an ad campaign where they talked about why they were number two and why it was so much better for you, the customer, that they were number two. Because their, their reasoning went, um, if you're number one, you get kind of complacent. You kind of rest on your laurels. You don't try as hard. You get kind of cocky. Uh, but if you're number two, you're always working really hard to try to be number one. So you're working extra hard to win the customer over. And that's why Avis will give you better service. So great example of taking something that you know, most people would have said, darn, we're number two. We can't, we can't run with this. How do we position and message based on something else? They ran it, and they turned this thing that was bad and made it something good. They turned a bug into a feature. How many of you have heard of ugly fruit or ugly vegetables? Yeah, so in some uh, grocery stores in Europe, they can't stay stocked fast enough with ugly fruits and vegetables because um, in due in part to this amazing marketing campaign, so uh, the grotesque apple, the ugly carrot, the failed lemon, they made fruit that used to be seen as um, bad quality or deformed or you know, didn't, didn't make the cut to be sold with all the other fruit. They turned this into a great thing. And now people actually want this more than normal fruit. 
And then, of course, we talked about Simple Human, where they took the least glamorous product ever, a trash can, and turned it into a luxury good. So whether your product is boring or glamorous is entirely up to you. There's no such thing as a product that is too boring or an industry that is too boring. You might think, well, we make back-end software for logistics or for HR, and that's super boring. There's nothing interesting we can say about it. When you think of that, just remember the companies and the examples that we, that we just talked about where anything that's boring can be made to be interesting. And Flexport is a great example. My friend Justin works there in San Francisco, and they're the hottest thing right now. They do shipping logistics, which is pretty much as dry as it gets, and yet they've somehow turned this into a topic that's interesting, where people lean in and want to know more and are excited to work on this product and excited to work there. I love this quote from Picasso, and I'll paraphrase. He basically says, some painters turn, a yellow blob, turn the sun into a yellow blob, and then other painters turn a yellow blob into the sun. So stories can help you do that. Stories can help you turn the yellow blob into the sun. And that's really your job as a founder uh, and as, as a leader within your startup to think about how can we make whatever it is that we make into something that's interesting and exciting for people. So to wrap up, we talked about a lot today, uh, a lot of frameworks, a lot of first principles of marketing, a lot of different concepts. But marketing is really part art and part science. When you're dealing with people and the way that people behave, the way they'll react, it's hard to have a really definitive, if you do this, it'll work every single time type of statement. Um, there's really no guarantees. And what works today might not work tomorrow. And what didn't work today or yesterday might work tomorrow. So staying flexible and being willing to try uh, instead of just giving up on a certain tactic, be willing to try to see what really works for you. And then lastly, it's our responsibility to help people care. If you're working day and night on this amazing product, on this amazing startup, you might as well go the extra mile to help people understand why it matters. Because otherwise, all of this work is for nothing. So if you go the extra mile, connect the dots for people, go the extra step to help them contextualize how you fit into their worlds, not how they fit into your world, this helps people see why the work that you do really matters, and it helps them get excited about your vision. OK, to wrap up, the ducks. When you look around, you might see your friends, your competitors, your peers. Everyone seems to be doing kind of well. Everyone knows what they're doing, or you know, they lo just launched this, or they were just covered by the press, or they just won such and such award, and they're posting it on LinkedIn. And you look around, and it feels like everyone knows what they're doing and has a solid plan, and they're executing that plan, and everything is working out great. But what's really happening is that we're all ducks paddling like hell under the surface of the water. So if you feel like this is really hard, it's because it is really hard, and it's not just hard for you, it's hard for literally everyone. So don't get discouraged when you think about, how can I tell better stories? How can I connect with people? How can I improve my marketing? Know that everyone else is figuring it out as they go along the way, too. So keep your head up, and um, I hope you took at least one thing away that you're excited to try when you get back to your desks. Um, if you want to stay in touch, here's my contact information. And you can get a slide summary of the key points of the slide if you text the number that's on the screen. All right, thanks, guys.